Yes. So welcome to this online seminar after Brexit, what next for the Economic and Monetary Union, the UK and the EU. More than 100 people have registered for this uh, online seminar, so we are quite happy to discuss with you. Um, so the UK referendum uh, raises a number of questions and some of which concern more the UK and some concern more the wider European project. But most issues in my mind are the two sides of the same coin. Uh, one has just to look uh, uh, how the markets reacted all over Europe uh, to see that the vote in the UK is not simply an internal affair of the, of the UK, of course. So there are big economic questions we will be touching upon today, uh, economic and institutional questions. Um, we should uh, however, here I put in a personal, a personal note, we should however not forget that the UK referendum also has a strong and sometimes immediate impact on the personal lives of people. So continental Europeans living in the UK, uh, UK and also UK citizens um, who feel wrapped of their European uh, citizenship and identity. So for me, for example, I've been born just one year after the UK joined the European community and um, for me and people for my generation and people younger than me, it's unthinkable uh, that our friends and colleagues from the UK might not be European citizens after the 1st of uh, January 2019. So indeed, uh, Eurobarometer suggests in 2015 that 56% of the UK citizens feel as European citizens, not reflected now in the, in the UK referendum. So um, I just wanted to show you quickly one thing to go back to history. This is the original letter of application by Prime Minister Wilson from the Labour Party at that time, from 67, um, where, when he lodged the UK's second application to join the European community, which then, after some forth and back, uh, led to the, uh, to the um, negotiation of Britain's admission in uh, 73. Um, so we have the UK referendum raises a lot of questions, and we are not going to answer them all today. Uh, we rather focus our attention on uh, some specific aspects. So whether to push for more economic integration, whether uh, and who should be allowed and under what, are, what conditions to join the EU market, the single market, and also whether to push for other dimensions of EU integration. Uh, we have gathered an excellent panel to discuss these issues. Um, we have uh, Joaquin Almunia, the former Vice President of the European Commission, former Commissioner for Competition and also former Commissioner for Economic and Social Affairs of the European Union. We have, uh, in alphabetic order, Ramon Marimon from the European University Institute, Professor of Economics here, um, also leading the ADEMO project, which is dealing uh, particularly with the first two questions we are going to discuss, and he's also chairman of the Barcelona Credit School. We have Giorgio Monti, who is head of department of the law department here at the EUI, so we are also throwing in a legal dimension to this discussion, and professor of competition law. And Morten Raven from University College of London, Professor of Economics and former Head of Department. The questions I've uh, raised previously, all these questions have to do with the idea of whether now that the UK is or will be out um, of the European Union, whether we should take this as an opportunity to push for a deeper integration. Um, economic, political, institutional, that's the question mark. So the seminar's titles and question is very much in the spirit of let's move on, what comes next, uh, what are we going to do now? Um, however, allow me please, before we are going to discuss what will be the next steps, what are we going to do now, I would like to, to take a couple of minutes to discuss, um, to pause and to think about some of the lessons learned from the UK referendum. and. Um, um, because I think that this is a time of serious reflection. We, we really, really need, before moving on, we, we need what, what have we learned here and what has the UK referendum told us. So we might get away with the no referendum being held in any other member state. But is this the avoidance of other referendums really the only concern we should have? I'm not so sure. Um, so I would like to focus on three aspects I think the UK referendum has raised very, very quickly and uh, throw these into the room as a kind of a background music for our discussion today. So we are not going to answer these, um, but they should be in the back of our mind, uh, in my mind. So the first aspect I would like to, to raise here, to throw into the room is um, what is the economic integration really supposed to deliver? And to whom is it supposed to deliver? So I hope that uh, Joaquin will agree with me here that competition is not a value in itself. And also economic integration is not a value in itself. It's not a goal in itself. But um, 
we expect this to l deliver something bigger. Um, so the question is, what, what is its main purpose, economic integration? So is it simply a necessity to say, okay, within the global markets today, we can't survive uh, in Europe. So we sim it's, it's a necessity. We have to do economic integration and we are not expecting anything else from economic integration than just we have to do because there's no alternative. Or is it still something uh, of a wishful thinking where we think, no, it should deliver something more. And if we expect it to deliver something more, um, how do we solve the interplay between the European Union institutions and the member states. We are often talking about burden sharing between member states, but um, there's also burden sharing between EU institutions and the member states. As we have seen, there's always to pass the buck uh, between member states and the European Union. And uh, can we really afford this? So how can we make sure the European project of economic integration is delivering something and is smoothing economic and social inequalities across the European Union? So the UK referendum, in my mind, has made it painfully clear that there are many areas in the EU where people feel left behind. So that's the one aspect. Um, secondly, so ah, I wanted to show you something which I found interesting. There was a first UK referendum two years after the UK joined the European Union, where 67% have voted to keep Britain in Europe. Um, and I wanted to show you something interesting. It's only illustrating. It's not an evidence, of course. But in Cornwall, for example, which, which is one of the regions which has uh, got most of uh, EU support, financial support, in 75, 68% voted to stay in. And in the referendum just now on the 23rd, 43% only voted to stay in. And also in Wildshire, 71% to stay in in 75 and 47 today. So. Is there something happening we should think of? Secondly, do we need also here, I think it's connected very much also to these numbers, um, do we need better tools to communicate the benefits of EU integration? The uh, campaign in the UK was very aggressive and very misleading in many aspects. Um, but what could we do better to communicate better? What are the real benefits? Um, apparently, a focus on only economic integration and its supposed benefits is not enough. So perhaps we need a broader vision. And there, thirdly, and this I think is important, uh, connected to this point, is it not too dangerous to focus only on economic integration? Is, it, is the UK referendum not a very clear signal that we need more than a focus on economic integration and that we desperately need a common vision, a new vision for Europe and that we share as Europeans that goes beyond economic affairs and that is a political, a social and even a civic dimension of the European Union. So um, perhaps there's a good news. Um, there is a strong support for the economic and monetary union, uh, which is more or less steady. It's now, I think, can we see it here? It's very slow. It's 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 roughly 68% uh, in 2015. Um, there is support. Of course, this is not a public opinion. Even though the Eurobarometer, I've taken this from Eurobarometer, is always saying this is a, a data which is showing the public opinion. That is not public opinion. This is individual opinions. Uh, as we have also there painfully seen, the, the public opinion is created to, through public discourse and also through a lot of populism sometimes. So uh, we, we should not, we should not uh, mingle these two things. So that's, that's individual opinions uh, which might not reflect what is the public opinion here. Um, I now start with the three questions to our panelists. And um, to start with, I wanted to share with you what has been the answer by our, uh, by our participants, by today participants. So the first question question is, um, should the economic and monetary union be accelerated to become a center of gravity within the European Union, or should it be slowed down to avoid a centrifugal diaspora? And if it's to be accelerated, how? Um, the how we haven't asked you, but we have asked you whether it should be accelerated or slowed down. If you can see, a, a, a tiny minority uh, thinks that it should be accelerated. I would now like to first give the floor or to uh, Joaquin to um, tell me what he thinks. Should we be accelerating the economic and monetary union as a result of the, as a consequence of uh, the UK that might be leaving the European Union? Uh, you have to put on your microphone still, I think, uh, Joaquin. 
on the top. Yeah. Okay. Now. Okay. There you are. Thank you very I much. Think, I really think that uh, the economic and monetary union should be completed, and uh, not only because of the uh, reflections after the uh, London uh, or the the UK results of the referendum, but because uh, the crisis and the, the economic crisis starting in 2008 demonstrated that the uh, original economic and monetary union as defined. Uh, and the massive treaty in 1992 lacks some uh, very important uh, tools or aspects. The banking union that is now being uh, developed, but not yet uh, completed. A much more ambitious fiscal union to uh, complement the monetary union uh, developed by the European Central Bank with a common uh, fiscal uh, policy uh, orientation not uh, taking uh, the responsibilities of national governments, but establishing some instruments to uh, adjust the policy mix between fiscal policy and monetary policy in EMU. And third, and very important, the economic convergence of the economies belonging to the euro uh, is not working. It's not working because uh, there is a lack of coordination and because there is a lack of political direction. So economic uh, union, economic convergence within EMU means a much more ambitious uh, uh, sovereignty sharing by members, by governments and parliaments of the members of the Economic and Monetary Union. This, uh, I repeat, is not because uh, the uh, Brexit, is because what we learned during the crisis, since the beginning of the crisis, in the functioning of the Economic and Monetary Union. Can I ask you, Joaquin, that did the result of the UK referendum, you say it's business as usual, it hasn't changed anything, but did it change anything in your thinking about the economic well, and monetary I, union? I think the uh, Brexit uh, uh, can create uh, uh, temptations in some members of the economic and monetary union to uh, disintegrate or to reduce the level of commitment with the European Union and this would be a very bad news, not only for the Economic and Monetary Union, but, but the whole political project of the European Union. And the Economic and Monetary Union, as the core of uh, the process of integration, should be protected. And the best way to protect EMU from the risks deriving from Brexit is to follow the steps signaled, by, for instance, by the five presidents' report to complete Economic and Monetary Union. This will require political decisions, political uh, engagement by the leaders, by the European Council and by the governments and parliaments of the 19 members of Economic and Monetary Union. And let's not forget that some of the non-Euro area members would like in the near future to join Economic and Monetary Union. So Economic and Monetary Union in the next uh, 10 years probably will have as many members as the EU now the UK will be out of the EU. It, it was the uh, country with more uh, objections in the, regarding the Euro project. I don't know what will happen with uh, Denmark, that also has a legal opt-out. I don't know what will happen with Sweden, that had a negative referendum. But I tend to think that uh, if EMU is completed, following the steps signaled by the five president report, many members of the EU that are not yet within the Euro area will uh, ask uh, for being members in the next uh, five to ten years. Thank you, Joaquin. I, give, I, I go through in alphabetic order as uh, I have introduced all of you, so I would give the floor to uh, Ramon now. Ramon. Thank you. I tend to agree with uh, what Joaquin said, but I just would like to put things a little in perspective. I think the Brexit uh, has shown several things, but we can see it in a more general context in the following. We live in a very interdependent world, and movements of people not to want to understand this, to think that there are magic solutions where you can find it your way and that's it, happens everywhere. So this populism, uh, we can see it in many other forms, in the US, within the Union, and in other places. 
And what a lot of people have been disappointed or surprised after Brexit is, oh, wow, we have to find a, another solution. Which solution? Well, we never talk about that because we thought that we could just live on our own. And that's what needs to be a lesson for everyone. The second is that uh, even if people said, oh, well, people don't care much about Europe and the Union and so on, this has shown that there are very strong feelings about it, and in particular for the young people to be in favor. So I think that that's what the background that pushes to have you think that that much more is at stake, and in particular, in this case, to complete what uh, Gino Moni was mentioning, that we have a monetary union, but not so complete. Completion, of course, it's not only about economics, it's many other aspects. One aspect that is very important, and it's released to one of the reasons, questions you mentioned before, is that another lesson for all the politicians and for everyone and communicators to learn is that it can be very dangerous, the game of always blaming things that go wrong in Brussels or the Union, and then when things go well, it's your government who got the play. All the governments practically have been playing that, UK in particular, and that's what Cameron um, found himself after many years of being spoken against Europe, having to say, oh, no, no, I really like that. Well, that, that's not credible. So I think that that's very important to see how much it is a cause of that, that citizens understand well. What this means, too, is that I think in the process of completion, two things need to be achieved. One is that integration in the sense of all conversions and all look like the same will not happen. It will not happen in the near future. So we have to create uh, institutions that take into account that there are quite a lot of diversions and, uh, and disparities. But disparities are in many places. And also, there are disparities in the states of so the United States. So you want to have to create institutions that take this into account. But also institutions and rules that citizens can understand. They have to be relatively simple. And I think that's another aspect that needs to be done. But there are many aspects, for example, to have more resharing, that after the crisis this is understood. But we need to do it. It cannot be that we only act after a big crisis. It cannot be that we let the situation deteriorate. And in many cases, that requires, yes, for some states to do reforms. So I think that's many lessons we have learned here, which pushes to, yes, I think we should I want to say accelerate in the sense that, oh, now, tomorrow we can get everything, or tomorrow we'll converse, but to do the job. And if an institution works, at the end, people accept and recognize and uh, acknowledge. This had happened with the ECB. Many people were very critical of the European Central Bank, and now banks and firms and so on see the major role had played in not making this recession even worse. Thanks. Thanks. We come back wait, l later to the concrete steps, I think, we, uh, because that's, that's uh, of course, now the, the interesting point. I give the floor to Giorgio. Giorgio, from a legal perspective, um, so we need Okay, let's see whether we can hear you. Please okay. speak loud, so you are sure. louder than you are. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have three points. I, I think generally I agree with uh, Joaquin Almunia's comments that in answering this question about economic monetary union, the referendum is of little relevance. That is to say, economic monetary union needed fixing, notwithstanding the, the Brexit vote one way or the other. One point to add to that might be that some of the existing rules also need improvement. So, for example, the surveillance over the balanced budget rule is imperfect as it stands. So, not only do we need new rules on banking union, um, fiscal union, etc., but that the existing rules need also to be strengthened. The second point is that one thing that emerges from the referendum is a reluctance to engage in uh, extensive treaty reform, which some of these measures uh, provided for in the Five Presidents report requires. And so on the one hand, you have an economic need to push forward with monetary union, but on the other hand, you have some, legal reluct some political reluctance to uh, move forward towards integration. 
And the third point I would make is I wonder whether what the EU needs at the moment is what in the UK was called the third way. So at the moment what you can say is that the EU over the last 40-50 years has served to upgrade member state governance. It has improved the way in which member states manage their economies. However, at the moment the perception is that the EU does so improperly. And this is best exemplified by, for example, the privatizations of uh, the Greek ports or Greek airports, which appeared not to have been to the benefit of the Greek state, but more to the benefit of the investors. And so some intermediate mechanism by which the EU can re continue to work to upgrade member state governance needs to be found, but the answers aren't easy. I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you, Ramon. C can I just ask you to give us uh, one example where you say the treaty would need reform as to be able to um, push further the economic integration? Um, I think anything to do with uh, fiscal union or anything to do with increasing solidarity may well require further treaty revision. Thank you. So I give the floor to Morten Raven. Morten, uh, thank you very much for joining us from London. Um, so in your mind, should the economic and monetary union be accelerated or should it be slowed down? Yeah, I, 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 I think it's hard to say. I mean, um, I, I agree with uh, Ramon's initial statement that uh, we face a lot of problems that are, that are global, uh, international in nature. and. Uh, and, be, and the EU and the, the EMU play a, a key role in addressing those. And it's important that we don't lose that. But, but I think what the referendum in the UK showed is a more general reflection of something that's happening in Europe, which is a, a wave of nationalism and populism. And I think uh, national policies, they, they, they must address the root causes of this. Uh, uh, which perhaps have to do with uh, issues like lack of social mobility and, and inequality and, and, other, uh, and other issues. And, and the EU is just an easy target in this uh, uh, when it comes to thinking about that. Uh, but national policies really uh, need to be rolled out there. Uh, and we shouldn't forget that although Brexit is a, uh, is a dramatic, we've been We've been very close to that in other recent referenda in, in Greece and the Scottish referendum. And of course, in, in Denmark, uh, the Maastricht Treaty didn't pass through the first time either. So it's, uh, it is the more dramatic one, but, but it's not the only one. So I think there's a general issue here that needs to, that needs to be addressed. And uh, in a set, I think maybe uh, one thing that has to uh, we thought a little bit about in, in, in the EU is that it's a, in, in the UK, but I think it's the same in, in Denmark and in other countries that there's a view that Brussels uh, is that that's something else. You're not part of Brussels, uh, and that's why the, the easy it's easy to to blame Brussels for the problems. Uh, uh, you're not see, in the UK. You're not seen as a part of that. And uh, and that, that that seems to me that that's a bit of an issue, and and, and perhaps uh, perhaps that needs to be thought a little bit about how, how how one can easier communicate that, but also make clear how our national countries and governments have an important say on, on what's going to happen there. Now, when it comes to the EMU, of course, I think I think one issue here is that um, of course the the monetary union is uh, is is quite diverse and. Uh, and uh, very different degrees of, uh, of, uh, of uh, economic development across the, the EMU countries, despite the fact that, uh, of course, uh, not everybody has, uh, has entered there. And, uh, and um, those disparities are bigger within, in, within the EU than uh, across the monetary union, but, but even within the monetary union now uh, there, and, and so that, so I think that there's a there's a little bit of an issue here about the risk sharing versus redistribution that need, perhaps needs to be uh, thought about. Uh, and it's clear going forward, perhaps one uh, that uh, one one perhaps should think a little bit about the model of the monetary union. What is the best way to proceed now? Is it to further integrate, or is it perhaps to have in place uh, mechanisms uh, uh, where one allow for some. Uh, independent fiscal policies, but but uh, but there are other mechanisms. So, 
I, I have no strong view on whether it should go one way or the other, and I don't think the Brexit has a direct uh, uh, consequence for how we should think about EMU. But however, I do think that there's a there's a view now to uh, think through this and and also think about uh, the treaties uh, reforms of those like Giorgio was talking about. So. Uh, yeah, so whether it should go one way or the other, I, I personally don't have a strict view on whether we should now press for for further integration in, in, uh, for EMU, but, but I do think there's a, there's, there's a need to think about it. Um, after all, had there been a Brexit in a country that was also a member of the monetary union, uh, I think perhaps there would have been more even more dramatic consequences of that. So we kind of need to make sure that that doesn't happen. So you couldn't hear me? Yes. Okay, so Martin, you couldn't hear me? So I, I repeat, I just, I, I just, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, okay sorry, I just pressed a button here, involuntarily. So the question is, so you mentioned the social inequality and uh, my question was whether this is something to be addressed mainly at the level of the European Union by EU institutions or whether this is something that has to be solved on the level of the member states um, in your mind, Martin. Well, I think that the, in terms of inequality and social mobility, that has to be national states. That uh, at least do, a, do a, a main part of that. I mean, that has to do with educational systems and other things, which I think uh, would be very quite difficult for for the EU to get directly involved in at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, before we, I see that there's lots of people submitting questions. Before we, we are going to, to look into these, I, I also see that some of our panelists are also already answering to these. But I first want to go through the other, through the other questions. And this time I will start with uh, Martin. I put on the next slide the question. And here the answers of today's participants were very, very clear. Should an exit country be allowed free entry to the single market without exacting freedom of movement? So this, of course, um, uh, is very much about what will be the scenario for the UK. Should it really, and I still don't want to believe it, should it really uh, leave the European Union? Uh, is it the model of Norway? Is it the model of Switzerland? Is it the model of Canada? Um, but our participants clearly say 85% they should not be allowed entry to the single market without accepting uh, the freedom of movement. Uh, Martin, um, what is your view on that? Well, so, yeah, so here we're getting into guesswork because um, I guess nobody, not even the Brexit campaign, kind of uh, had the thought through what would happen after Brexit. Uh, uh, after the referendum, should the Brexit uh, campaign actually win it? So I think it came as a big surprise even to that camp that they, they won it. And essentially, uh, they, they didn't, it has become clear that they really didn't have a plan for what, sh what should happen after that. And I don't think it will become clear until after uh, we have a new prime minister in, in, in the UK. And perhaps even at that point, it will take a bit of time uh, to become clear exactly what, it, what is to happen. I think what is clear, though, is that the UK really does need the access to the single market. This, this is needed uh, uh, in order to protect the, the inward FDI, in order to protect the UK exports to, to the EU market, in order to protect the, 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 the future of the financial city. Uh, so, uh, so I think the, the UK really needs to, to uh, reassure access to the single market, although uh, it is somewhat unclear uh, what the main candidates for taking over as prime minister and taking over the leadership of the Tory party, Tory party, exactly what they want is, I think it's clear that one of them uh, uh, probably thinks the same as what I'm saying now is, is a little bit unclear with the other ones. 
Now, uh, so could um, so could free mobility of labor be sacrificed in in future negotiations? I I, I see that as difficult. Uh, I it's I think it's politically quite difficult, but but it would also be a problem for the EU going forward if we start uh, doing uh, too much cherry picking. And uh, after all, the free mobility of labor is one of the main tenants of the of the single market. So I I see that as difficult. So. Uh, and it's not clear. It, I mean, it, prior to the red referendum, the, the UK had, had uh, reassured s several concessions on uh, here, including the, the, the right to uh, in-work uh, benefits and so on. So, um, so the, the, those, of course, are off the table now. Uh, the question is whether they, they will come back and whether these will be things that will be negotiated about. But I think as a main principle, uh, it will be very hard to sacrifice the uh, free mobility of labor or, or at least some restricted mobility that, that I don't see. But it is hard to say what the, what the UK government will ask for and what is the road forward. It's perhaps there's a pos possibility of a second referendum, but it's, it's, uh, it's totally out in the open at this point. We simply don't know. Okay. Giorgio has just answered. Um, it's too far-fetched today to imagine a second referendum would steer up an even more far-fetched debate than we I, have at present. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think we can have a second ref referendum unless it become, becomes clear what, what the Brexit plan would be. Uh, the, the, the issue is once that becomes clear, uh, what will Parliament do then? Will they simply pass a, a, a Brexit deal or will they ask for the population to approve that and that, that is unclear. But going back and, and simply voting about the same question again, I don't think that will happen. Okay, thank you, uh, Martin. So I, I pass on to Giorgio. Giorgio, um, apart from the interesting question whether an exit is easy from a legal point of view, easy to, to, to organize in a couple of years, uh, as we understand there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of uh, things to be dealt with. But um, after that, in your mind, should an exit country be allowed free entry um, or not? Is there something pro? I mean, there seems to be a very strong consensus that we should not allow okay. Is there something more provocative than pro okay? Well, I think one has to look at the options that are realistically available to a country wishing to exercise the Article 50 exit route. So, if you weigh up the costs and benefits of the various options, it's not particularly clear where one might end up. So, for example, suppose uh, the UK says, I'd like to have an agreement like the EEA or indeed join the economic, uh, uh, European Economic Area composed at the moment of Iceland, like Liechtenstein in Norway. Now, under that agreement, virtually all of EU law would remain in force and the free movement of uh, persons would remain. The only benefit of that is a small saving. Uh, some estimates I've seen are that at the moment for membership to the European Union, the UK uh, in 2013 paid 10.8 uh, billion euros. It would likely pay 1 billion euro less if, to, if it were a member of the EEA. So you could sell that as a benefit to the UK in saving. On the other hand, it would lose a considerable voice in the way in which EU laws are implemented. And one of the things that comes particularly clear from an excellent set of reports published by under the auspices of the British government called the Balances of Competences Review, it is clear that a number of respondents say that the UK plays a vital role in the development of EU legislation in a way which is seen as being very beneficial to the UK uh, economy. And so the UK exiting, the, it's it re resiling from having the capacity to exercise voice is quite problematic. A second option, the Swiss option, which is to have a discrete sectoral treaty, a uh, set of sectoral treaties with Switzerland, is problematic because what we've seen with the Swiss example is that Switzerland effectively autonomously adopts quite a lot of EU law as it is on the one hand and so you end up with the same situation as with the EEA but on the other hand the European Union is not very keen on replicating the agreement with Switzerland it sees that it is very problematic and very costly to continuously negotiate on that basis so the Swiss option is out 
And the third option would be to have no treaty but rely on WTO agreements or have an EU-Canada-like agreement. But the problem is negotiating that has taken many, many years, many more than the two years provided under Article 50. So that option doesn't seem plausible either. And the fourth option, which is to have an ad hoc solution just for the UK, would just be totally unacceptable. One cannot be seen that Article 50 becomes a basis by which people can pick and choose what is in the, what you do when you exit. So an exit route that is uh, achieved for the UK in this context would have to be something that you could be able to replicate if other countries opt to exit. You don't want to create a precedent whereby exit means you can pick and choose what bits of Europe you like and remain on those bits and pieces of Europe that you do like. So if you look at the options in that perspective, the only realistic option is something along the lines of the EEA agreement or indeed joining the, economic, the European Economic Area, which then yields uh, the situation where free movement of persons remains. And the other options appear quite difficult for a number of reasons I've suggested. I'll stop there for now. Thanks. Thank you. Giorgio, can I ask you a favor and please in the chat box um, share the reference you you've just mentioned for the people so they could look it up. That would be really, really kind. Okay, so I'm uh, moving on to uh, Ramon. Ramon, from a more economic point of view. So uh, there seems to be, I mean, listening to Giorgio, there seems to be a very clear answer what would be the, the, the only uh, legal option of uh, which, which road to take, um, what do you think? Well, I think that shows why referendums tend to be very confusing. And people have been very confused. Because if you had asked, do you want to remain in the EU or move to the AAA? And people, first of all, ask, what are we talking about? And second, we'll say, well, why should we just make such a fuss about this? Mm. And maybe people were very reasonable, and yes, happened. The problem of referendums, people become unreasonable. So, and part of the confusion has been not just free movement within the European Union, but the fear of the invasion of migrants to Europe arriving to UK. So that's uh, and that's the confusion and the and the pity because it's uh, to blame to everyone, but uh, that we cannot solve the problem of migration in uh, on. Yeah, of course, it's been it's a very difficult problem, but instead of sitting down and saying, look, we have a serious problem, it's taking a little more time, it has been too easy to make the analogy about that. Because if you concentrate only on the movement within the Union, probably people will have, because they are used. I mean, they have benefited from Polish and a lot of people working there, particularly in London, but in UK in general. So, but uh, the fear of something else has been there. And of that, something that the union has not been very good in general is in drawing the lines and seeing how much can we do. Uh, has been exposed a little, but and this will have needed to be done. You can, I can understand very well, I mean, it's unfortunately, that people uh, risk their lives to cross the Mediterranean. I have a hard time to understand, or oh, it's very telling, but people risk their lives to cross the channel. And that's something that people should think a little more. Because one thing is legally we owe for, for free movement and so on. The other is our, whether our labor markets are really open to everyone. Even if you look at the, where people were deciding to go, you can just tell. This is the ranking of the countries that have more open markets and are growing. Mm. Why they risk their lives? In, why didn't they stay in France? It's not just a question of language. I don't think so. So I think that we cannot be hypocrite uh, on these things. So if we can disentangle, which is not trivial, but you need to disentangle the fact of what is movement within, to what the migration laws, and when you discuss migration law, law, laws and everything on rules, and, and you define a some frontiers policy, which is common and all that stuff, you take into account which are the countries that are more affected by that, things will be slightly different. Mm -hmm. So I think that you cannot discuss what the deal is without solving the migration or having a more clear policy on the migration mm -hmm. for the European economic area, if you wish, because now that's the only possibility for them. Having said that, 
there is an issue underneath, which is, should we play tough with them after they have been really in talent sale, from Pendleless card away, okay, uh, for this, and now they say it's okay now. Yes, I mean, from contract theory point of view, you, you, the toughest you make it, the hardest it is to, the more costly it is to leave a partnership, people stay in the partnership, but that should not be the way we are. I mean, if the, if the cost has been fear, now it, it's to be rational and clear-minded about these things. And it's of interest of the, everyone that the in market works. But not only that, the people works in many other dimensions that you can move on everything. An example, Schengen. One of the reasons uh, UK didn't want to join in because they wanted to have the ability to close it at some points. Well, I mean, I've been in Paris and Brussels this week. We don't have Schengen. It's really painful to go through the airports. But there were reasons for that, and everyone understands. So why we made that mess at that point, that, that they were out and we are in, if we're going to, at the end of the story, do the same thing, very much. So I think that if we are more reasonable and more credible policies, then I think that gives much of a, a role of how we solve these issues. Okay, thank you, uh, Ramon. Uh, Joaquin, you have really the, of course, the institutional perspective of what is politically feasible and what is not politically feasible. So it seems that there is not among all the other European players an agreement how to treat the UK. Um, in your mind, what is the most realistic scenario? What will happen? Will it be the Braccio di Ferro, as the Italians would say, is it now the hard line against the UK just because, like with Greece, we are, we are panicking, somebody could repeat this, so we have to stop that? Is this the best way to react uh, in the European Union? Should we not be more self-conscious and be more relaxed and uh, see what is the best for everybody to do? But what is also politically feasible in your mind? Your microphone again, I think. Uh, I put it on for you. Da -da -da -da. I can. Yeah. Okay. Now we should hear yeah. you. Yeah. So uh, after the 23rd, after the last week's uh, referendum, I think the uh, division among the uh, Brexit uh, camp is much bigger and uh, much deeper than the divisions among member states when they met couple of days ago at the, in Brussels for the European Council. So it's true that uh, among member states, the 27 plus the EU Commission and the EU Parliament, there are different approaches. Some voices tend to uh, ask for toughness in the relationship with the UK, and other voices are more complacent, trying not to create additional problems to the ones created by the result of the referendum. But in any case, everybody agrees on the EU camp that uh, those who will try to follow the British example, organizing a referendum for the exit, will not be encouraged. So nobody could think that after a Brexit result or a similar result in other member states, their situation will be better than the one they had when they were members of the EU. This is clear. But uh, uh, among the Brexit camp, there is a big, big, big uh, discussion what is the way out. They were not able to clarify their positions during the campaign, and now they are not able so far to clarify what will be the request they will put in the letter asking for the Article 50 negotiations. Uh, there are, as uh, Monty and others uh, said uh, just before, there are many, or four or five or six uh, alternatives. I think the best one for the British interest is to be as close as possible to the Norway situation. So within the internal market, but uh, the internal market includes free movement of labor and free movement of people. So to abandon the internal market will be a, a big, big loss for the UK and to remain within this internal market will mean that they have to accept 
the principle of free movement of persons and free movement of labor that were, was one of the main issues as an argument for those in favor of Brexit. So they are in a very difficult situation. How to manage this uh, is to be seen. I hope the uh, negotiations will be as uh, peaceful as possible. Everybody is interested in finding a good uh, agreement at the end of the negotiations. But for me, from my point of view, it's clear that the situation of the UK at the end of these negotiations out of the EU with an agreement with the EU27 will not be better than the one they had until uh, last Thursday. Thank you. I would like to, um, to move on to the last question we had, but I would like to combine it now to have a very quick last round. I see that most of the questions anyway have been answered already by the people who have been submitting, so I would like to then just use the time again to make a last uh, round with the panelists. Um, so the last question we had been asking is whether the EU should uh, remain as it is or should increase its capacity, like should it increase its capacity in the banking union, border security, research funding, environment, and so on, or limit its scope. Um, I would like to, to combine this with another with another question. I think it's, it, it, it is very clear uh, from all the panelists' comments that we cannot only focus on on the economic aspect, and there's the wish for a stronger coordination in, in, the, in the other spheres. Um, the question is more, um, let's assume we are in summer now, let's assume we would be in Christmas time and you had a wish list to submit. Uh, what would be your wish list? What would be your, 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 biggest, your biggest wish for how to move onward now with the European Union and the European integration? And who would be the key players to make this happen? So that's the short question I would like to ask each of you to give a very short, uh, concise answer. Joaquin, we are starting with you. Yes. Well, my uh, uh, wishes is, as I said before, to complete economic and monetary union following the lines of the five presidents report. I will not repeat it again. Second, I think the EU should uh, have as soon as possible a sensible and uh, clear, ambitious migration policy, because it's true that the migration issue is not only a big issue among the British public opinion, it's a big issue in most of our countries and will continue to be uh, a big issue for the, for the future. So migration policy is needed if we want to preserve and to deepen the single market and the free movement of people as a principle. And third, I think the EU needs to uh, have a security strategy. Uh, the other day, uh, Federica Mogherini, the high representative, uh, uh, put forward and uh, the commission adopted the strategy, the new strategy uh, document for the EU. Now the leaders, the uh, European Council will discuss it and the foreign affairs ministers. Security is of the essence because uh, our citizens feel unsecure and they think that the EU is not protecting their interest, their uh, lives, and their future. And uh, security is one dimension that the EU abandoned in the past, feeling that uh, the protection of our security interest was provided by the uh, US, by NATO and the, the United States. I think in the future we need to take on our shoulders this responsibility, and this will be, in my view, or this should be, in my view, the next uh, frontier of uh, EU integration apart from the economic issues. And in your mind, who's, who's the main actors or institutions? Who are the key players to well, push that forward? Uh, taking uh, into account the present degree of integration, for these strategic uh, decisions the, uh, at the highest political level, the head of state and government at the European Council will continue to be the ones who have the, the, the obligation to make uh, decisions, to adopt decisions, and among member states, uh, Germany and France continue to be the most important players, but I think other countries, such as Italy, Spain, or others, uh, will need to be more responsible and will, be to be, will need to be present 
not letting alone Germans and, and French, because if uh, France doesn't agree with Germany or Germany doesn't agree with France, we cannot be blocked. Thank you very much, uh, Joaquin. So I go back to, in which order were we? Uh, Giorgio. Okay, sure, thank you. Well, if it's Christmas, uh, I think my wish list would be that the members of the European Union find a new narrative. I don't know what the narrative should entail, but I think the problem is not one of specific policies, but one of communication. So over the first 50, 60 years of European integration, there was a clear narrative. Results were delivered. Uh, countries were happy to follow suit. At the moment with Brexit, what we've seen is the absence of a narrative. In fact, the whole Brexit vote is problematic because nobody voted in favor of anything. They voted for a dream that didn't exist. Huh? We don't know what the future is, but we voted for something better than what we've got. What we've seen now is that a number of states are making overtures about what the terms of Brexit will be, and all of them are positioning themselves to safeguard their own interests. The Union needs to try to corral these interests together and to find a common way to move forward. Uh, but this re really requires a different method of communicating the benefits of uh, European Union and uh, uh, a new vision about what the EU is all about than we've got. I mean, we can all identify piecemeal policies we'd like. I'd like more liberalization of markets, which I think would be significant, but I think uh, a more uh, grand vision is required, which I'm not capable of providing just now. And it, would, this, would this be a civic, uh, would this have a civic dimension for you, or is it political leaders providing this narrative? Top down or bottom uh, up? <laughs> well, hopefully bottom up. That is to say, responding to the the ways in which uh, people uh, have reacted, but also educating. Uh, on the other, you cannot just uh, see this extraordinary fear of migration dominating uh, political debate. I mean, to a certain extent, top down has to be to uh, allow people to understand the, the benefits. And that's why a communication strategy is important to ensure that you know what the EU does and does well is communicated uh, uh, clearly, uh, so that uh, support for a more imaginative union is brought forward. Okay. Thank you very much, Giorgio. So I'm. Handing over to uh, Ramon. Ramon. Yeah, I think I'm just going to add the things. I agree with uh, most of the things that have been said on the wish list. But I think an important aspect is that we stop or we move forward just to be too intergovernmental. I mean, it cannot be that all discussion is now is going to Germany is going to sail and this, that, and that. This has been a, den a problem. And that makes uh, that uh, people don't have a lot of trust in how the European Union or the Eurozone works. So we have to reinforce the institutions which have not a specific name. I mentioned the case of DCV as a successful one. We should develop more in terms of resharing. I think it's possible, even with the current status of the European Stability Mechanism, to do better. We can move ahead more in some fiscal policies. Certainly, things that we can do in terms of security and migration, those things will, will understand. People want a solution to these problems, and, the same, and that's the same people we all see. If you, as I was saying, if you travel and, and you see how much better it is to travel under Schengen than without Schengen, people see those benefits. Okay? So I think that uh, it's in this dimension. If we keep going, that it, it all depends that uh, Merkel and uh, Holland agrees on that, we are not going to go very far. And I think it's a time that the uh, people question or make it more serious that the institutions we have, they should be few, but they should be working and people should understand how they work and how they relate to it. So that's my main wish. The others, I think, okay. come along with that, which is to provide the uh, others public goods that uh, they are come along. And, very important, don't forget, we started uh, the century with the Lisbon strategy and all that stuff, and somehow we forgot about it but uh, because of the crisis. But that's what will really take us out of the crisis in terms of not only globalization, but also more innovation and more research and all these things, which seem to have been gone out. But those yeah. still things that we need to do. And when we do it, we do it quite well. So I think that's what needs to be done. Okay. Thank you, Ramon. Dear. Morten, I give you the last words of the panel to tell us about your 
dreams <laughs> for Europe. Well, so I mean, I'm I I, I feel European. I, I, my wife is Italian, my daughter has three European uh, passports, I worked uh, throughout Europe. Uh, I, I really wish uh, that, uh, that uh, my daughter and other generations are, are going to grow up uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment that offers as much as I've been offered by, by the EU uh, over the past. And I, in, in the UK debate, immigration was a big issue, although immediately after the vote, uh, the Brexit campaign said it was never about immigration, really. Uh, and, and, and that's, of course, because uh, um, the reason why there's been so much uh, EU, EU immigrants uh, flowing into the UK is because of the strength of the UK uh, economy. It's not they haven't come just to, to relax. So I, ju I just hope that uh, going forward uh, the, the EU institutions will, will survive and, and become stronger and uh, the, the EU will be there for the future generations to, to benefit from and it will uh, deliver something. Um, reforms will be needed, that I, I do think, but, but, I, but I hope we get a better Europe in, in going forward, not, not, not a breakup of the Union. Mm. I mean, 72% of people under 25 in the UK did vote to stay in the European Union. That's the yeah, future generation. That, that's, that's exactly why I, I think it's very irrational and very dangerous when people are saying that we should go out now and, 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 uh, and do bad things to the UK because of this vote. Because five years down the line, you know, uh, if it's clear with, the, with how this worked out across generations that the young people and people up to even uh, the 50s, they're very strongly in favor of the EU and continued membership and, and so on. So the question is how to, to, to maybe uh, limit the damage that happened because of this, but I think the, the EU, in a sense, if they can address the issues I, I mentioned earlier with the growing nationalism and populism, uh, that, then the future should be good, but it does require action. But I also hear, similar to what Giorgio said, I, I hear, I do not know may, whether I make a false interpretation that this is a bottom-up. We need civic engagement and intervention by the European people, by European citizens, into the debate and to make their voice heard. Yeah, that, I think I that, is, uh, yeah, that is true, yeah. I agree with that. Okay. I would like to thank um, our panelists. First, first of all, for this very, very interesting discussion uh, we had today. I also would like to thank very much uh, our participants um, who have been submitting their, their answers while uh, registering, who have been submitting a lot of um, questions and comments here in our chat box, uh, who have been active. I do hope that we continue this discussion. I think we are, as I said in the beginning, in a period where we need to reflect seriously where we are going, where we want to head with the European project. It's a time for reflection and it's a time for getting engaged and to make the voice heard. I think that's uh, very, very important. Um, we researchers, we will try to support the quality of the debate with as much evidence and critical thinking as possible. and. Uh, but there is more needed. I thank everybody and uh, I wish you all a very good day and cross fingers it won't happen in the end. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, Thanks. everybody.